Welcome to the third episode in season three of 180 Days Education Podcast. We are excited to have you join us. I'm Karen Greenhouse, one of your hosts. And I'm Tim Pope, your other host. And today we are really thrilled to have an old friend of both of ours, Kareem Ani, who is the founder of Mathalicious, which is now actually called Citizen Math. And he has also just recently authored a book called Dear Citizen Math. And Kareem will be sharing with us his journey to this place and talking about the book and the whole idea behind it. So we're excited to hear from him. Yeah, it was a, it was a great conversation. I, I've always enjoyed talking to Kareem. He tends to be very plain spoken and manages to be challenging in a way that's still professional and respectful, if that makes any sense. Because I'm like, wow, all right. Yeah, you just sort of called that out. Okay. <laughs> exactly, right? He's so interesting. So just um, before we start, as usual, Tim and I are going to just share some noticings and wonderings that we've had about the world, the education world today. So I am living in Pennsylvania and we had our first like real snow, five inches. And so my notice is that school was closed and did not go virtual the first time, but then the second time it went virtual. So I am wondering, are snow days going to become a thing of the past, which would be a shame because those are one of the things most kids <laughs> look forward to. And it just makes, you know, the day off even more exciting. So I'm just wondering, is that going to happen? Tears by many kids. And I mean, they really are a challenge. I know traditionally as teachers and then as kids, the whole snow day thing. Yeah, like the surprise day off school. But it's always been, like, if you're a parent, like, what do you do? If, you have a, if you're a working parent with small children, like this, the system really isn't equipped to support that. Um, so I suspect the parents might not be upset, although <laughs> replacing a snow day with virtual learning probably doesn't actually solve the problem. That's what I'm saying. They're replacing it now with virtual, so it doesn't solve the parents' problem. <laughs> it just solves the school's yeah. account, you know, towards days. So that's my wondering. Are they going to disappear because we can now do virtual school so we don't lose that time? So I don't know. Just a wondering. It doesn't help parents, so maybe... <laughs> I don't... It's, a, it's a great wondering. I... I mean, I know, I mean, as a former administrator, like getting the days in and getting the minutes of instruction in is always a challenge, especially when weather wreaks havoc. Um, so, yeah, it's a tough one. I mean, my notice and wonder is related. Oh, okay. Which is, so we're on holiday break right now. We're just, uh, we're getting ready to go back to school this week in theory. And as I've been reading up in the States, as the schools have struggled with how to handle this latest variant of COVID and do we open up again? Do we go back to virtual? I just curious, like this, this just seems to be an incredible challenge. That's my notice. My wondering is I don't know, like what's the right thing to do? <laughs> like I read uh, specifically the Chicago Teachers Union has come out and has certain requirements that they um, are demanding in order for their teachers to be willing to come back on campus. And they're getting some negative press for that from non-educators and I mean others I mean other everyone's handling it their own way and I'm like I just I, I don't know what the right answer is and I you know I don't know that there is one it's so politically fraught because we're having the same issues here where I live and and you know the angry parents yes you must go back and how selfish of uh, the teachers to not want to go back you know like it's this whole horribly fraught situation we don't want to go to virtual so yeah I don't know if anyone has answers or um, ideas, please let us know. My opinion is, as long as as long as we don't go back, that hybrid thing was horrible. Yeah, yeah. So uh, an I, either or kind of situation. Uh, who knows? Exactly is my is my very strong preference. Like, I mean, obviously, yeah, I'd prefer to go back and see kids. It's easier to to reach kids, connect with kids. I mean, and I can deal with the the virtual. Like, I mean, we had a lot of practice with it. I've, I've figured out the tools I need to use to be able to do a class as best I can in that environment. The hybrid thing was just a challenge I never conquered. All right. On that note, with no answers, <laughs> let's go. Let's go right into Kareem. <laughs> <laughs> So 
So I am thrilled to introduce our guest for today, Kareem Ani. I am been looking forward to this conversation all day. I've read your book over the summer, and then last week I spent some time was at the Robertson Center. You and Linewand and a couple of folks did a group chit chat that was posted on YouTube last week. Um, so I've been looking forward to the chance to chat and catch up. It's been a while since we've chatted. It has been before. It was right before the right before the pandemic. I think you were just about to go. To Thailand, if I remember, to write the book? Thailand and then Australia. Yeah, I was in Australia for all of 2020, basically. So I, I skipped COVID. And I would actually like Kareem to maybe give, you know, the short version of how he got to where he is now. Like Citizen Math, he's written a book, um, which we are definitely going to talk about. And we're going to have all the links, by the way, for those of you listening in the show notes. So you'll have a link to the book and the link to the Citizen Math site. But if you could just kind of give us a shortened version of your life history, how you got to this point. Well, I grew up in Richmond, Virginia, and then I, I went to prep school. I went to boarding school in Massachusetts. And after that, I went out to, to California for college and I studied economics. And then, you know, I really spent most of my 20s uh, traveling around the world and then coming back to the States and teaching and then going abroad again and coming back and teaching. And uh, it it was really not until the end of my 20s that I decided to kind of get back into public education and and stay there and really have that be my have that be my career. And so I started out as a Spanish teacher and then I became a middle school math teacher in rural Virginia and New York City. And after that, I did become a middle school math coach outside of DC. And when I was a math coach, uh, you know, I was given the mandate of, you know, help teachers teach better. <laughs> and I think you know, as, as a lot of coaches who listen to this will, will probably recognize, like, it, it wasn't much more concrete than that, right? And so it was kind of up to me to figure out kind of what that meant. And one of the things I observed was that it's very difficult to teach math. We know that students don't necessarily like math all that much. Um, but the observation that I had was a lot of that uh, was because the content, the lessons that teachers were teaching, you know, I was, I was, working with these teachers, many of whom are really good teachers, but it's almost like they were successful in spite of the lessons, you know, that the textbooks that had these really irrelevant word problems about nonsense situations. And so that is when I began to write lessons around real world issues. And then this was around 2009 when Congress was debating the Affordable Care Act. And I went to a, a town hall meeting in Reston, Virginia, which you may remember at the time, I mean, this Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, there were all these town hall meetings around the country and they, they were awful. I mean, just really terrible. People were screaming at each other and pointing their fingers in one another's chests. And, you know, on CNN, it was kind of like the meltdown of democracy. Sort of where we are right now. Well, it, it, <laughs> it's worse. We're kind but, of repeating ourselves. Yeah. I mean, you know, the pe people who were surprised by how... how by how sort of incivil and how counterproductive American discourse has gotten, um, this is not a new phenomenon. I mean, you know, so I, I went to a town hall meeting in Reston expecting that it was going to be a thoughtful exchange. Um, I, I have quite a bit of Virginia pride, <laughs> even though, you know, I left here a long time ago. Um, but, you know, Reston, Virginia is, is a very well-educated part of the state. And, you know, you have a lot of influence from D.C. and, you know, Central intelligence, like literally central intelligence is down the road. <laughs> so I thought, surely this is going to be thoughtful. And, you know, there was a rabbi who was giving the opening prayer. And I, I went back and I found on C-SPAN, I found the transcript. And he, he was praying for civility. And before the prayer even finished, people were already screaming at each other. And having studied economics, you know, I was sitting on this basketball court and I was looking around and I thought, man, like this really is what it looks like for a country to come apart. Uh, and I thought to myself, I thought, you know, health insurance isn't, it's not complicated. You know, it's, it's expected value. It's the probability that you're going to get sick, uh, you know, uh, times the, the, the cost of fixing you. And, and so if you're high risk, health insurance is going to be worth a lot. And if you're low risk, if you're young and healthy, it's going to be worth much less. And, you know, I was sitting on this basketball court in this high school, looking around, thinking, God, if we could just have this conversation through mathematics, you know, like using this tool of expected value, this conversation would go much differently. You know, we wouldn't necessarily agree on, 
you know, whether there should be an individual mandate or whether health insurance companies should be allowed to deny coverage based on pre-existing conditions. We wouldn't necessarily agree, but if we at least allowed mathematics to inform this conversation, we would disagree more constructively. And so that really did become the, the genesis of what became Mathalicious. And then, you know, as Tim <laughs> pointed out, uh, citizen math. Uh, so, you know, what motivates us is, you know, really using mathematics as a tool for analyzing real issues, important issues like health insurance, interesting issues like, you know, conventions and pricing, uh, really using mathematics as a tool for looking at the world and um, discussing it, discussing it rationally, debating it respectfully, and, and really kind of changing the types of conversations that take place in, in math class. And so uh, this is sort of seems to me a perfect place for me. I marked uh, one of the things in your book. So, so Kareem's written a book called Dear Citizen Math, How Math Class Can Inspire a More Rational and Respectful Society. It's fantastic. There will be a link in the notes. But one thing that I think this kind of really leads into your book very nicely. You say, and it's right at the beginning, that math class is an incubator of a thoughtful society, which is what I think you were uh, alluding to here with that or giving the analogy with the the um, Affordable Care Act. So can you expand on that maybe a little bit more? You know, I, I don't think this is going to be a surprise to anybody. Uh, it just seems like we as a country have gotten really bad at talking to one another. Um, you know, our our... Our debates aren't really grounded in anything substantive. Uh, we're, we're just very emotional. We're very opinionated, but, but we don't always kind of substantiate our, our disagreements in anything rational or, or evidence-based. Um, and, you know, the way that I see it, there exist in any society, there exist two institutions to, to really challenge people to think critically about the world and to expose them to different ideas. For adults, it's news and media. But unfortunately, you know, as we've seen, that's become increasingly partisan, um, you know, more, more and more ideological. If you're on the left, you can watch MSNBC. If you're on the right, you're going to watch Fox News. If you're on Facebook, <laughs> they're going to just feed you up a steady diet of whatever it is that you believe already. And so the only other institution that we have as a citizenry is school. Um, and because mathematics is such a powerful tool for thinking objectively, for thinking analytically about real issues in the world, then, then you know, all of us at Citizen Math, you know, we really have come to view math class as, as really just um, like you said, you know, an incubator of a rational citizenry, basically the place where we can learn how to think critically um, about you know real issues that affect us, uh, so that you know when these kids graduate and take take over the reins of this country, <laughs> you know, hopefully, you know, maybe they'll be able to manage it, you know, better than, than we have as adults. So can you maybe give a little bit more um, insight into what Citizen Math, like the website, what it is that you offer that is allowing, that would allow teachers or students to have that approach? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, take, take the thing that's top of everybody's mind right now, you know, this pandemic. Well, you know, we in the States have lost o over 700,000 people, I think at this point already. And I think a large part of that is just because we, we never really talked about how, how viruses propagate through a population, but they grow exponentially, right? I mean, you pass it to three people and they pass it to three and they pass it to three. So pretty quick, you're at 27 and 81 and 243 and whatever. And Math class is the place where if when students in high school, they're, they're learning exponential growth, if they come to citizen math, you know, we offer up a lesson where they're going to apply exponential growth to analyze how a virus will spread through a population and how long would, you know, based on different parameters, how long would we expect it to spread throughout the whole population of the world? And what are some different mitigation strategies, you know, if, if we institute uh, quarantines or if you know, X percent of the population becomes immunized. Like, how will that, how will that affect the spread? You know, where this is different, where citizen math, I should say, is different than traditional resources, is that, you know, traditionally, math class, math teachers, math textbooks, the goal is always to understand mathematics, right? To understand procedures, to understand concepts. 
Now, oftentimes they'll use the world to do that. Uh, but the world in most cases, if you open up any textbook, the world in most cases is, is really being used as almost like this convenient frame for contextualizing some underlying mathematical concept. You know, so take the, the kind of stereotypical, you know, two trains are going towards a station. How long is it going to take till they reach the station? Like that task yeah. isn't about trains, right? Like students don't walk away with a better understanding of trains. Trains are just being used, right? I mean, trains are just being used in that case to contextualize linear functions. Um, how long does it take to fill up a water tank? Like that's a great way to get kids to talk about volume, right? Um, we're sort of the <laughs> inverse of that. So for I us hope not. <laughs> in citizen math, the goal isn't for students to get better at exponential growth necessarily. Yeah. It's for them legitimately to use exponential growth to understand how viruses spread. Our lessons aren't just slightly different than, you know, what I think a lot of us are accustomed to in math education. They're completely different because they exist in a totally opposite direction. Again, like textbooks typically use the world to look at math and citizen math lessons use math to think critically about the world. And there's the line, there's the line I was hoping you would say, because I was going to ask you about, I'm like, or how do I ask him a question to talk about that? Because that's the sentence I have quoted you on that so many times in the last six months in my, in my department. Can I ask, extend that? And I don't remember this was in the book or I know it's what you, something you shared and when the panel discussion you did with the Robertson Center what, a couple of weeks ago, but in terms of using math to look at the world. And then you made a comment about often we skip the penultimate step. Oh, we skip the last step. Yeah, the last step, right. Yeah. We, ne- we, we skip the last step. So can you talk a bit about what you meant by that? Sure. You know, that's, and I, I'm glad you keyed in on that um, because it, you know, it, it's kind of in the weeds sometimes, but, you know, I, st- I started Mathalicious in 2009. Um, and so I've been, I've been doing this work for quite a while. And one of the things that's been interesting to me is one of the most difficult things in my experience for a lot of teachers is just to get in the headspace of walking into a lesson, walking into the classroom thinking, <laughs> we are here I don't know about that. <laughs> today to talk about how viruses spread, or we are here today to talk about you know, whether baseball stadiums should be standardized. We're going to use parabolas to do that but we're here to talk about baseball. We're here to talk about health insurance. We're here to talk about shoe pricing because we have become so habituated to really just using the world as this frame for, for teaching math, but mathematics is the thing that ultimately <laughs> we care about. And, and so one of the things that I've observed, um, and it's always fascinating to me, is that teachers will oftentimes skip kind of the big discussion that comes at the end of, of these lessons. You know, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I, I just referenced the one about baseball. I'm a huge baseball fan, and so I kind of perpetually have baseball on the mind. But there's a lesson called Out of Left Field where what students do is they're given some information about the average major league home run over the left field wall, so the height that it's hit from, the maximum height that it reaches, and the distance that it goes. And this is all based on StatCast. Uh, and so what they do is they write a quadratic equation to model that parabolic trajectory, right? And then once they do that, that process, by the way, is actually quite difficult. Um, you know, because the ball is being hit from three feet off the ground, it isn't necessarily kind of symmetrical around, you know, the, the, the maximum height part. And so they derive this equation and then they graph the trajectory and then they compare the trajectory to the left field wall of every major league stadium, right? All 30 of them. And what they, they do that in order to determine, you know, which stadium is the most difficult for home runs, right? So over which left field wall would the ball clear it by the least um, and which is the easiest. And then they, you know, they end the discussion or they end the lesson by debating like, so does this give some players an unfair advantage? And if so, should Major League Baseball standardize outfield dimensions, right? Because Major League Baseball is the only American sport, I believe, where, where the playing surface actually varies by location. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So football fields are all the same. Basketball courts are all the same. Hockey rinks are all the same. Um, are they different? But it, yeah, but it's not worth getting into. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Well, but baseball, <laughs> but baseball fields are dramatically different. Yes. And so all of the mathematics is driving in that direction of, you know, here's this thing. You're going to go to a baseball field. You're going to go to a baseball stadium, look at it, and you're going to look at this different. But of course, you can really only do that if 
if you have that conversation at the end. And it isn't rare for a teacher to skip that last conversation, right? And think, well, we've derived the equation. That was the difficult part. That was kind of the the richest mathematical part. And I'm just going to cut it there. Because I reached the concept or I taught the concept or they practiced. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, because I did, I did the thing that I've always had in mind that I was supposed to do. Um, now, a lot of teachers might say, look, I don't have time to do the rest. I've got standardized testing to deal with. And, and so they're not, they're not being unreasonable. Um, but I, I think that decision really is rooted in, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of years of emphasizing mathematics as the sole thing that we're here to learn, but not really prioritizing mathematics as something that puts us in a position to have conversations. Um, now, that being said, we get letters from teachers, not all the time, but <laughs> not infrequently, where they say, I was going to leave teaching and I found these lessons and I decided to stay. And the reason every time they say that, the reason that they cite isn't that these lessons, oh man, this is a great way to teach kids how to write a quadratic equation. They never say that. What they say is, these lessons put me in a, in a position to have a conversation about something real with my students. And that is why I got into teaching in the first place. It's, it's interesting, you know, we seem to have forgotten, uh, I think as math educators, that these classrooms, these math classrooms or settings can be settings for the most interesting conversations. It's almost like we've forgotten how to facilitate, you know, rational conversations about real issues because, you know, we've, we've just so laser focused on procedures and concepts for so long. And yet, you know, when we go home, you sit around the dinner table, you know, you're hanging out with your friends at a bar or whatever, like very easily we get into conversation mode. And so I think what's fun about these lessons, and I think what's rewarding for a lot of folks, at least what they're telling us is we're kind of bringing, this is going to, man, this is, man, this is going to sound kind of marketing, uh, but I'm just thinking of this kind of off the cuff. Like it really is bringing that real world conversationality like back into the classroom. So that kind of leads into my next question, which is you have a, a section in your book, part four, that says addressing common concerns. And you've already brought one up that, you know, teachers are very focused on standardized assessment because that is what they're judged upon, right? That's what the schools are judged upon. And so I am sh- I know that's definitely an excuse for, I don't have time for this type of problem solving because I have to get through this content, right? So in their mind, the time it would take and the discussions that students would have interferes with their pacing and their finishing the goal or covering the material. So how, how do you address that with uh, uh, schools or teachers or districts that you're working with or that are interested? Well, it's a great question. And there, there are a number of different ways to respond to that because it's, you know, that's a, that's a reasonable concern. You know, we only have 180 days and we've got this test and a lot of my kids come in with, you know, knowledge gaps and deficits that we've got to fill. And, and wouldn't it be fun to talk about, you know, health insurance or, or whether people's small feet should pay less for shoes, but that's not going to be on the test. Um, I think there are a couple different responses to that. The first, the easiest response, honestly, is we actually have a substantial amount of data that shows that when you do teach real issues, when you allow students to use mathematics to talk about real issues early, uh, they end up understanding the material better and performing better on the tests. So Northwestern University a number of years ago did a, a pretty large scale uh, research study into then Mathalicious in Virginia, looking at the impact of our lessons on, on Virginia SOL scores. So that's their standardized test at the end of the year. And what they found was teaching just two lessons in one year um, resulted in student tests or SOL gains, so standardized test gains that were essentially commensurate with moving a teacher from average to the 80th percentile. So teaching, uh, let me just say that again, like teaching two lessons in one year had a larger, I mean, it was, it was, you know, a pretty outsized impact. And so you say, well, why is that? And I think, I think there are a number of reasons. One is, you know, kids forever have been asking, why am I learning this? Like, when am I ever actually going to use this? Like, what is the point of my learning this? And when you can answer that on the front end, you 
you maintain their motivation. You know, you give them a reason to then formalize that knowledge later. Uh, I think that's one. Another is, and this may be unique to citizen math. I mean, we we work really hard to to make sure that our lessons are written in a way, even though what we care about is students, you know, talking about a real issue and walking out of the classroom with a better understanding of pandemics or, you know, coupon schemes, whatever it is, like some real issue. We still write the lessons in such a way that we know that they're going to develop you know, mathematical fluency. The, the questions are written where it's like, this is really going to force you, student, to to really wrestle with the mathematics as well. Well, and I might add a third. To me, citizen math, it's problem solving where, yes, okay, so we go back to your baseball example. It was about the quadratic. But in the process, they're doing data collection. They're doing comparison. They're using so much more math than just that one concept. Whereas if you're just teaching process and procedure, you're really focused on one concept at a time. So they're doing and applying multiple concepts. And so you're actually learning more mathematics just by doing one problem. So, well, you're, you, you, you might be solving a problem in different ways. Um, we actually, you know, having been teachers ourselves, we, we've, we've been really careful to whenever we write a lesson, we're writing it for a unit. So if you go look at the website, the Citizen Math website, you'll see how every lesson aligns to seventh grade proportions or eighth grade linear functions or whatever it is. Because we know that if if we write a lesson that involves both like exponential growth and percents, whatever, it's it's going to fit kind of in neither unit. Um, and so, you know, we sort of have to, we not sort of, I mean, we have to respect the rules that teachers are playing by and units and kind of, but you're absolutely right that that these these questions really do require students to kind of come up with their own strategies for solving them. And th- they're mathematically rich. Um, and Tim, actually, you know, you were joking earlier about, about us changing the name to something less silly sounding, but you really put your finger on it. I mean, you know, we write lessons around things like opiates and, <laughs> you know, all sorts of stuff. And for years, the the name just sounded frivolous. I mean, it sounded... Like Snooky, um, <laughs> or like a candy. It sounded sort of like a candy, mathalicious. Yeah, like oh, that's delicious. And be like, yeah, it's delicious. But this, but this, you know, they're also they're difficult, and these are really gonna, these really are gonna stretch you intellectually. Um, so I was talking a bit about you know nuts and bolts like these actually can put students in a position to do better on the thing that you know they have to do better at. Um, but there's another, I think. Thing that I'll say to teachers as well, which is more of, you know, kind of the gut check. You know, it is, it is very difficult to open a newspaper today and not read a story about teachers leaving the profession. And I think that this is especially true of math, right? I mean, we're seeing, we're seeing computers play more and more of a role, you know, so these algorithms are essentially teaching kids and teachers are being relegated to like being lab assistants, essentially. Um, and I think school, a lot of people are really feeling that school is losing a lot of its soul. Um, and, you know, you could argue that standardized testing is part of that because standardized testing, like I've never met anybody, anybody in education who actually cares about the standardized test. I, not anybody. I've never met a student who cares. I've never met a teacher who cares. I've never met a superintendent who cares. I'm sure if we went and took a poll of state superintendents of education, I imagine they probably wouldn't care either, right? It's just something we created. And, you know, we got to do it. And I'm not saying we should get rid of testing. Testing plays a purpose. But my point is, it's almost like this thing that the system cares about, but nobody, like zero people who make up that system actually care about. And so as a result, like we're seeing a lot of people leaving. Um, And accountability is one of the major reasons, if not the major reason that teachers leave. And so you can say, look, even if these lessons didn't help your students learn mathematics better, they do. But even if they didn't, they are still worth incorporating into your instruction because this is the thing. These are, these conversations are why you became an educator in the first place. And if we totally, if we just take that off the table, then we're going to lose something really precious, you know? And I think, you know, what's really great is, yes, a lot of teachers put up resistance. A lot of administrators put up resistance. You know, we're not used to having these conversations. It may be hard for us to justify them, but once they do, 
typically around like after they teach two or three, kind of once they really get like, oh, this actually is different. We're here to talk about the world. It's pretty rare for people to want to go backwards after that. I mean, today there's a lot of things going on in education where people are, they're banning books and they're, you know, penalizing teachers for teaching critical race theory, which doesn't even exist, you know, that type of thing. And you do have a lot of problems that would be considered very controversial, right? You just talked about the opiates and stuff. So, I mean, have you had any pushback from anybody uh, about some of your problems or, you know, how do you justify that? How do you get them to put that in school? Because I would imagine in this volatile time that 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 might be a problem. Yeah, I'm so glad you asked. That's such a good question. And it's a really important question. Um, You know... On one, I, I know there are a lot of people who are dismayed by how kind of politicized education has become. I'm somewhat ambivalent. On one hand, I think, you know, I think people are running with some of these things way too far. But on the other hand, I think, well, you know, that's great that people actually care what's happening in school. So yes, I mean, we do have a, we do have a lot of lessons that touch on kind of hot button issues. You know, should everybody be required to to purchase health insurance? How are excessive use of force complaints distributed among a police department? You know, is there racial bias in death penalty sentencing? Now, the way that we approach them, and this is, and I should say, I don't think everybody a- approaches. In fact, I know for a fact that not everybody in in math education approaches these real issues like this. Is is we try to approach them as objectively as we can, right? So when we walk into a lesson on racial bias and death penalty sentencing, like our goal isn't to convince people that there is or is not. Our goal is simply to say, here's the data set. Let's kind of chop it up and look at it in different ways. Like, what do you see happening here? And we oftentimes discover ourselves, like what is happening as we, as we manipulate, as we, you know, uh, explore the data ourselves in, in the process of writing the lesson. And so I know that there are a lot of people in math education who are very concerned about systemic injustices. And in many cases, I think they're right to be concerned. The concern that I have when I kind of survey the landscape now and hear people advocating for, you know, math class needs to be a place where we promote social justice. The concern that I have is when people say that, they're presuming that they know what the just thing is. And I think that is really dangerous. One, just as a practical matter, it is guaranteed to invite pushback from people who disagree, right? And we're seeing that. But even more importantly, it, I think, disrespects mathematics itself, right? It disrespects mathematics as a tool for kind of unbiased, as objective as we can analysis. Um, And not only that, I think ultimately it's fairly self-defeating. I mean, we could absolutely write a lesson that pushes, that's structured in such a way that's kind of sufficiently crafty, that it's going to, you know, compel students or 95% of the students towards a particular, you know, conclusion. Like, yes, this is unfair. But if we do that, the kids only get there because we pushed them there. They actually didn't get there on their own. And I would, I would say that that conclusion is a pretty fragile one. Right. Because all it's going to take is for somebody else to come along and say, well, let me push you in the other direction. Right. As opposed to, hey, let's look at an issue. What do you think? Talk it out as a class. Some of y'all are going to think this thing. Some of y'all are going to think this thing. This is an opportunity to debate it and kind of refine your thinking. And so, you know, I I really do think that um, we as math educators, especially as we start to take on and start to address real issues. I think we just have to be really responsible in how we do it. Uh, Now, that being said, um, (laughs) I was having a conversation with somebody recently and he said, you know, look, why don't, why not just ignore all of the hot button topics, you know, ignore them all together because you guys have such an interesting library. Even if you got rid of all of them, you'd have such an interesting library, you know, should people small feed pay less for shoes? Should McDonald's allow parents to you know, choose their price or pay a price to like choose their happy meal toys? Should airlines be allowed to oversell their flights? He's like, you guys have so many cool topics that don't involve racial bias and death bunny sensing. Well, you know, why not just save yourself the headache? Save us the headache. And I said, um, I think there are a lot of people who walk around and all they see is injustice, right? It's like they're walking around with binoculars on and all they can see are the bad parts of society. 
And I think there are a lot of people on the right who are looking at that and saying, you know what, let's not do that. But I don't think the solution to binoculars is to close your eyes. And, and so what I said to, to him was I said, we have to include hot button issues in math class, not because they're hot button issues, but because they're part of the world. And if math class is going to be a place where we really train this sort of mathematical lens on the world, then we're going to see baseball, but we're also going to see excessive use of force by police. And we're going to see coupons, but we're also going to see death penalty sentencing. And, and so mathematics class becomes sort of this equal opportunity, you know, it's almost like a survey class on reality. And it would be just as it would be silly to only focus on a very narrow sliver of reality, it would also be silly to make that off limits. Now, now that being said, a question earlier, I think you, I think you asked, you know, have we received pushback? And I'll tell you a story. And this, this story is going to, it's going to be discouraging. And then it's not, uh, then it's going to be, I think it's, I th- hopefully it'll, it'll leave a lot of people really hopeful. So a couple years ago, when we were still mathalicious, there was a police officer in California who went to our website and saw that we had a lesson on excessive use of force by police. Now, he didn't have a, a then mathalicious account. So he just saw the thumbnail on the lesson page uh, and saw you know, that there was this problem that addressed this topic. <laughs> and so he called the school district and he asked the district to stop using mathalicious. And then we found out about it. And so maybe about a week later, he and I got on the phone. And I said to him, I was like, uh, you know, what's your concern? And he said, uh, this, was, this was in the wake of, you know, yet another shooting. And he said, you know, it's hard enough with all the news. It's hard enough convincing people that, you know, not all police are bad. The last thing we need is for math teachers to kind of use us as essentially like, like a whipping horse or whatever the, the right analogy is, you know, for teaching math. And I said, uh, man, I, I totally hear where you're coming from because yeah, like that is historically what math class has done is use the world to, you know, teach some concept. And, and I totally hear how, fr- how, why you'd be frustrated if people were using policing, you know, to teach bar charts or whatever. I said, but did you, did you actually read the lesson? He said, no. I said, let me tell you what actually happens in the lesson. I said, in the lesson, students are given five years of data uh, that the LAPD released. So after Rodney King, Warren Christopher, who was Secretary of State for uh, Bill Clinton, he went in and led what was called the Warren, uh, no, the Chris, what was it? the Christopher Commission. And they basically, LAPD had to release five years worth of data in the run-up to, to the beating. And what the data was about was you know, how excessive use of force complaints were distributed among its officers. And so LA had, I think, 24,000 officers. And over a five-year period, they received like 8,000 complaints against them or something like that. And so what the data was is, you know, how were those complaints broken down? So like how many officers received zero complaints? And it turns out that something like 3,500 of the 8,000 received no complaints over a five-year period. Uh, And I think maybe 2,000 received one complaint over a five-year period, whatever. But I said to him, I said, what students do is they analyze this data to determine what would be a more effective way of reducing complaints. Like, should the police department just institute department-wide training? Is the problem actually more kind of concentrated among a minority of the officers, in which case, you know, maybe you just get rid of those officers or focus on those officers? Um, it turns out, just as an aside, that in that five years, I think 10% of officers were responsible for 47% of the complaints. I, I, I don't have it right in front of me, but it was, it, it was something totally disproportionate. But that's neither here nor there, right? Because we didn't write the lesson in order to absolve police officers. I mean, it was just, we're going to look at data and talk about you know, which interventions would be more effective. And so I explained this to him, to the police officer, and he said, uh, huh, that, that seems like a valuable thing for students to do. And so I think for me, really what this demonstrates is there are people in this country, a lot of parents are really concerned about students talking about hot button issues in school. But I don't think based on this and based on a lot of other experience I've had, my takeaway is not that they're concerned about students talking about real issues. I think what they're concerned about is indoctrination. 
and people using school to kind of push an agenda. You know, I think this police officer's reaction, this like, huh, that seems like a pretty valuable thing for students to do. I mean, my observation over the past 11, 12 years is that I think as a country, we actually want opportunities. We want kids to have opportunities to think rationally and and to think in a way that's kind of free of bias. Because one of the few things that turns out, I, I learned this as I was writing the book, one of the few things that a majority of Americans agree on now is that our discourse has gotten really bad. Um, that's like one of the only things that we can agree on on the left and the right. And so I think, you know, we write lessons um, that put math teachers in a position where they can reasonably say, our only agenda here is helping students analyze issues and they will conclude what they're going to conclude. You know, we are not here to push them in any direction, but we will hold them accountable to the rigor of their thinking um, and their ability to to substantiate their thinking with this tool set of mathematics. I mean, to bring this back to what we talked about earlier, the whole not asking the final question, one of the things I like about the lessons is that last question doesn't always have an eat like there's not a right answer. I mean, you're using math, but the reality is the death penalty has there's so many different ways to look at it. Actually, one of my favorite lessons in citizen math is the speeding tickets lesson and looking at how cities derive revenue from speeding tickets, including the interest paid when people can't afford to pay the whole ticket up front. So it's not like, all right, is that a bad thing to do? Well, it's an easy knee-jerk thing to do to say, well, yeah, that's unfair. Poor people pay more. And then, But then the question is like, all right, well, how do we do it better? Because reality is the cities need this revenue to fund their cities. So what is what is the better solution? And there isn't, I, and like to the point you were making earlier, there isn't necessarily a right answer. It's like, can we use mathematics to look at this issue to become more enlightened versus we're going to use mathematics to show you that the death penalty is wrong and to show you that we should, that how we should charge people for speeding tickets. And, and that totally changes math class, right? If you ask, you know, student, what, what's the point of math? You ask a lot of teachers, what's the point of math? They're going to say it's to get the right answer. Even in math education, when we talk about, you know, this problem is open-ended, it's almost never open-ended. It just means that there are a bunch of different ways that students might take to get the one answer, right? Right, exactly. Like, that you is know what so I mean? True. Um, but Tim, you're absolutely right. Like, you know, what is the fairest way for, for cities to make money, you know, like, should they increase the initial ticket amount? Uh, should they add a monthly fee for people who can't afford to pay it off? Um, there are upsides and downsides to each of those. Like, should the federal government increase the minimum wage? Well, if they do, if they, you know, increase it beyond what economists would call the equilibrium wage, like, there's going to be an upside for employees, but there's also going to be a downside for others because, you know, maybe the restaurant is going to lay off workers because now labor is more expensive. And, that question, you're absolutely right, does not have a right answer. And when we start to incorporate, you know, these conversations into math class where there's no expectation that we're all going to agree because there isn't one answer to converge to. One, I think for a lot of people that just makes math class a lot less intimidating. But I think even more importantly, to come back to the line that Karen referenced earlier about kind of incubating a rational citizenry, incubating a responsible, thoughtful citizenry, I think it really does begin to help students develop an appreciation for, in the book, I called it informed ambivalence, right? This idea that because I've analyzed the situation mathematically and because I've analyzed it from multiple perspectives, I may actually be less certain about it than when I came in. In fact, I'll give you a story. I just, I just heard this a couple of days ago. Um, I was up in Rhode Island and I met a teacher who uses citizen math with her students. And, you know, we were just getting coffee. And she told me they did, they did the lesson on opiates. So what the lesson looks at is kind of opioid tolerance. It uses exponential decay to model opioid tolerance. So, you know, when your doctor prescribes to you like an opioid, like OxyContin, um, it's going to provide you essentially like maximum pain relief in the beginning. But the more you take that medication, the more accustomed your body becomes to the pain relief. The dose that might have given you 100% relief you know, early now might only give you 50% or 25%. And so what happens is, you know, patients, because they want to be totally pain-free, will just start to up their dosage, right? And maybe they're, then they're going to run out of medication. And so then they've got to get 
pills illicitly, or maybe they upgrade to heroin or fentanyl or whatever. You know, they're studying the math of all of this. But then the last question is like, who do you think is responsible for this? Um, when, when people overdose, do you think it's the patient? Do you think it's a doctor? Do you think it's pharmaceutical companies? She, so this teacher was telling me that she, before the lesson, she asked students that last question, like, hey guys, what do you think? And she said there was one student who was just dogmatic. It's absolutely the patient's fault. Like you're an individual, you know, it's up to you to, to determine what you put in your body. Um, and she said, by the end of the lesson, she asked that same girl again. And the girl said, well, I still think ultimately the responsibility is on the individual. But then she turned to another student in class who had, you know, the opposite takeaway. And she said, but I can see it from your perspective. I understand where you're coming from. <laughs> and I, you know, it's one of those moments where you're like, man, wouldn't it have been great if your local news station had been in there to record that? Because isn't that exactly like, isn't that exactly the country that we want to live in where we as a citizenry can turn to somebody who thinks about the world in a completely different way and say, I disagree with you that we should have an individual mandate. But I understand your reasoning. And so I am going to be, I, I'm just going to be less dogmatic about it. You know, my certainty has been eroded. And I think this, you know, Tim, I, I'm so glad you bring up this issue of these questions that don't have right answers. Um, you know, when we went from Mathalicious to Citizen Math, Mathalicious used to have like 140 lessons on it, I think. So we had three lessons for every major middle and high school unit. And when we went to Citizen Math, we just had to pare that down. So now it's, it's for every major middle and high school year, six, seven, eight, algebra one and algebra two, we jettison geometry. Much to my chagrin, having taught geometry last year. But yes, I understand why. Yeah, I mean, it's just geometry is mathematical navel gazing, right? Um, <laughs> and I don't mean that in a bad way, but I mean, geometry exists. <laughs> Do you know, I mean, maybe you have a beautiful navel, you know? But, I mean, you know, but it's not like actual authentic applications of, of geometry. Like there are some, you know, special white triangles and things like that, but it's proofs um, and theorems and things like that. And it's, maybe it's worth learning. I don't really have a strong opinion, but, but we did not prioritize it. And so when we were deciding which lessons to write, to rewrite, because we wrote everything from scratch when we went to citizen math uh, with three criteria. Uh, the first criteria was totally subjective. Um, do we think the question, the driving question, is either interesting or socially important? So should people with small feet pay less for shoes? Like, that's pretty interesting because it's challenging a convention. Um, so we kept that. How many movies would, this is our most popular lesson, how many, on Mathalicious, how many movies would you need to rent uh, until Apple TV and Netflix and Redbox were like at what point <laughs> the one became like the more cost-effective movie, movie service. Like that was the most popular lesson, not even close, <laughs> um, like far and away the most popular lesson on math list. But we looked at it, we were like, who cares? Like who cares how many, movie, you know? And so that lesson got jettisoned. So that was the first criteria. Second criteria was, and I, actually it was Eli Luberoff who articulated this to me. He's the guy who started Desmos. He was talking about an aspect of, of Desmos lessons that he really likes or when, he, he can tell, it's a criteria he used to determine whether he likes a Desmos lesson or not. He said, are there, are there interesting ways for students to kind of get the wrong answer? Um, I interpreted that in our world as, are there interesting ways for students just to do the mathematics? You know, maybe you're going to do it this way, maybe you're going to do it this way. And so that was our second criteria. And as a practical matter, that's actually really helpful for school administrators who are, because a lot of folks use citizen math as PD, right? So they'll use our lessons to bring teachers together, do lesson study and, and train up on multiple representations or, you know, kind of standard fare for, for math education, like places that a lot of us could get better. They're using our lessons as a jumping off point for that. And so we needed to make sure our second criteria was, you know, do these lessons put them in a position to do that? But then the third criteria, and I think I can't imagine any math curriculum company in history <laughs> has, has had this as a criteria, but the third criteria was, does the question have a right answer? And if it did, we were less likely to prioritize it to be rewritten and therefore kept on citizen math. So, you know, a question like, why is it that when you, you know, sometimes you watch a car commercial and it looks like the wheels are spinning backwards, like, why is that? Well, mathematically, it's very interesting, but there's a right answer. It has to do with the frame rate of the camera, right? So we did not prioritize that one as opposed to should Major League Baseball stadiums be standardized? Should we increase the minimum wage? The one that you mentioned, like, you know, how should cities gain revenue in a way that 
you know, allows them to fund local services, but also doesn't put like an unfair burden on certain constituencies in their communities. Like there, there are no right answers to any of those questions. Um, and the reason that we thought that that was such an important criteria is because when you look at the questions that we as a citizenry struggle to talk about, they're all legitimately open-ended, right? Should we have a mask mandate? Should Sturgis motorcycle rally be shut down? I mean, these are really big questions, but they don't have right answers, but they all require mathematics. When you ask like the Sturgis question, is there also at some point in that lesson process, a place where you identify your priorities? Because like, I mean, so to me, in terms of looking at it even handedly, I like the Sturgis example. I mean, if I prioritize... I should say that's not a lesson. I know it's not a lesson, but that's almost why I want to talk about it for a sec. Because then (laughs) um, do we prioritize like fundamentally, is it our criteria is I want to look at the data and figure out, all right, what is going to be the the, uh, preserve life and health? Um, Or, I mean, in the case of Sturgis, a lot of people say we should do it. It's a whole, well, I value the ability to make the choice and it's a freedom conversation. So where when where when you tackle these uh, more um, socially, what's the word I'm looking for? I mean, controversial is not necessarily the word I want, but issues that people would feel strongly. Is there a point in the lesson process where you address those sort of fundamental perspectives and preconceptions? Well, you know, I was shooting from the hip on the Sturgis one. Um, okay, you can pick one that you can pick one you know better if you want to move if you want to move away from that. Well, no, the, no. The reason I say that is because, and it, it actually offers good insight in the way that we write lessons. I mean, you know, I have no, I have no idea um, what that lesson would ultimately be about. Um, you know, we we sit around and we just talk it out. Some early on, I don't know if it was Chris Lusto or, or somebody kind of coin this idea of a citizen math lesson, we know that we're writing it correctly when it just sounds like the natural conversation that we would be having as we walk down the street. But the way that we would write those lessons is to have the conversation. And maybe, you know, maybe sometimes we'd even have to leave the office and go walk down the street. And so, Tim, I mean, you and I could probably sit down and have a beer and talk about Sturgis and we would see where we go. But the point you're getting at is you can go down a path, but that path branches but it could have also taken another branch. And how do you decide, you know, which, for, it's very Robert Frostian, right? Like, how do you decide which path to take? Because there is an editorial decision being made in there. And I suppose that it would just be the one maybe that, that felt like it got to the bigger issue. I can see two big issues, two big questions that I have coming out of this Sturgis question. One is, Kind of how do you quantify? It's not even about freedom. That that's too abstract. I think it's more like how do you quantify community? Because these people who are you know flying to South Dakota and renting motorcycles or driving their Harleys from New Jersey or whatever, like that is a community for them, um, and that is something that they really look forward to. And they all come together and they they're in this beautiful place and they, you know, how do you quantify that? I don't know how one quantifies it. Uh, certainly, it's not like local GDP, right? But there is some there is some value to that, um, and so if we shut it down, we would lose that value. And so I imagine a lesson would get at that somehow, or try to anyway. But then there's this other issue of all of these folks go home, and we know epidemiologists know that when these folks go home, they contributed. They contribute. I think I heard a number that it was like eight billion dollars in healthcare related healthcare spending that was related to Sturgis, right? And so then the question becomes like. I don't know, maybe it ultimately just gets down to like, <laughs> which of those values is higher? Like the social enjoyment that these people get as being part of a community and $8 billion. Like, are they getting $8 billion worth of enjoyment out of it? Like, I don't know whether that's where the lesson would have gone, but I I think just sitting down to talk about it, I imagine that it might have gone somewhere that might have been ultimately the thing that students are uh, uh, intended to wrestle with in the end. Well, I think it's to, to the credit of you and your team that you spend the time to think about how do we frame this in a way that makes it the most open to discussion. And like you said, being very conscious of like, I mean, we could frame this or we could provide a data set to totally skew this in one direction or another. That's what you're looking to do. So I think that's, that's to your credit. So here's our last, the, uh, we started our new little piece to end each interview. And then Karen and I will chime in as well. 
is asking you to share something in your recent professional past that sort of crushed you and then something that inspired you. Oh, man, crushed me. Uh, God, pull up a chair. Uh, <laughs> oh, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> well, no, look, it's, it's funny. I mean, you know, we've, we've tried to take on a really big problem, a big social problem. Um, we're trying, I think Citizen Math is trying, and I think in, in many cases succeeding in helping people expand their understanding of what it means to teach math and what a complete math experience is. And so you can imagine, like within the educational community, we get a lot of pushback. That never bums me out, ever, you know, because teachers operate in constraints. And also, like, we sort of took on that challenge. So we knew that we were going to have to, you know, push back on that. And, and the book was written in that vein, like, hey, we know you've got some concerns and let us offer you an argument. Um, for me, the thing that's actually been really discouraging is the role that people who operate without constraints are playing. Um, I look at a lot of these foundations. Uh, I look at a lot of these tech foundations in particular who are funding, you know, <laughs> adaptive learning systems uh, for kids to just sit on computers all day. Uh, I find that just incredibly destructive, but they've also just become you know, some of these foundations are just pouring millions, hundreds of millions of dollars into this. And it's, I think it's, it's going to be really difficult for us as a community to kind of fight back against that. And the thing is like, once that's done, it's done, right? Once schools have swallowed hook, line and sinker, that education happens on a computer, then we're not going to invest in PD. Teachers think it's going to get worse. Curriculum is going to get worse. And all we're going to need, all we're going to do at that point is like double down on technology. And I think at that point, like we're sunk. So that really just scares, uh, scares the hell out of me and really bums me out. Um, and then also, you know, you have a lot of these foundations who are funding some big like social justice type things, which sounds great until you really play it out and you think, man, this is going to get a lot of pushback. And also like the lessons, all they're going to be doing is using racism as a way to teach percents, you know, and it's like, <laughs> not only are you going to invite half the country to get really angry, like you're not even going to be trying to solve the problem. You you say matters to you. And so I think there's just a lot of mudding of the water that really bums me out. Um, but the thing that makes me feel good and the thing that excites me is I'll just go back to that conversation on Saturday. You know, there's a teacher and, and her, and by the way, this teacher in Rhode Island, I was talking about, like these kids aren't, this isn't Groton or Exeter. Like these are kids who pre had pregnancies, dropped out of school, um, failed, and came back because they had always been just like not served very well by public education, math education in particular. And then you've got this girl who uses exponential decay to analyze opioid tolerance and then says, yeah, I think it's up to the patient, but you know what? But I can see where you're coming from. I look at that and think, yep, that's it. Like, that's it. That's, that is what we started this thing for. And we can, we can absolutely, I find that so exciting, you know, and that there's a teacher out there who now can come to work and just be excited about facilitating conversations and just be a participant in a conversation, not the sage on the stage or whatever, like be a participant because that, I mean, I wasn't there, but I would have loved to have been in that classroom because in the same way that that basketball court in Reston, Virginia felt to me like democracy dying, I imagine that classroom must have looked like democracy being reborn. I know that sounds cheesy, but man, I mean, that is that, that in my opinion, is the possibility of math class. And I just, I think that is so, I think that's so exciting. I think that's so uplifting. We might put mine first because Kareem has a great ending note. Like that's a great play to end. Um, so I'm sort of going to cry. I sort of crushed myself this week and actually very relevant to this conversation. So I'm teaching linear programming right now with a curriculum that I had a heavy hand in developing. So not only can I blame myself as a teacher, but I can't even blame the textbook because I sort of had a hand in that. And so we're doing linear programming and it's a problem about uh, acreage and how much coffee versus cocoa. And I'm like, you know, I live in coffee country, so this is a relevant question to ask. And so it's this linear programming and you make so much per acre selling coffee and so much per acre selling cocoa and how much should you plan of each? And so we did and the students dutifully went through and we found our constraints and we did our vertices and then we finished the whole problem. Then the depressing and inspiring part was the student raised his hand after we're done. Mr. Pope, I could have told you this answer before we even started. Why did we do this whole problem? Why would you not grow the least amount of the cheap thing and the most of the thing that makes you money? <laughs> well, we used, to, we used to have a lesson on this, uh, something related. Can I, can I suggest a, a slightly different ending? It would make it feel different. Go ahead. Okay. So 
what you're getting at is free trade, essentially, right? I mean, if you go study economics in college, it's the whole comparative advantage thing, right? And so if you're relatively better at planting cocoa, then you should plant only cocoa and the coffee people should plant only coffee and then you trade. Well, that's all well and good until you know there's a trade war or that's all well and good until there's a drought. And you see this, like you can see this in uh, the Rust Belt, right? Where they were all in on steel and then steel imploded or coal country. And so there, it, there's a fragility. On one hand, you could make the case, you're, the student could make the case, right? Of like, invest in the thing that is relatively cheaper, that you're relatively bad at. But then you have this, you're accepting a lot of risk when you do that. And so I think the lesson that you wrote is a great lesson. I just think maybe what the lesson wants to be about is free trade and the dangers of specialization. I mean, and I mean, this problem was sort of a zonk for, and I could see it obviously could be improved. It's actually been a fun unit to teach in terms of a lot of the context. I mean, a lot of the students from the school I teach at, their families are in business. They're familiar with that context. And so they keep wanting to add constraints. So, you know, in a book, we try to sort of make things work so that it's the mathematics is doable. So it's fun to get kids engaged to the point, well, but Mr. Pope, it doesn't work that way. Where's competition? There's no constraint in there for competition. <laughs> True enough. But Tim, think on that because, because then, you know, kids will come out and they'll, you know, if they live in Michigan, maybe they'll see all these car manufacturers. And in particular, they'll see a lot of internal combustion based car manufacturers. And they might think this was really good for a long time, but are we setting ourselves up for a pretty heavy fall, right? Like, would it be better to actually be a little bit less efficient, but be a little bit more diversified? My joy was that a student called me out on it. It, was, it made me happy. It was like, hey, like the fact that they recognize that, all right, you're making us jump through hoops and I don't need to jump through those hoops to mathematically, to understand what's going on here um, is what brought me joy to the lesson. All right. I mean, mine are, mine are actually not deeper or whatever. They're just like, so I'm in classrooms or not a lot now, which is exciting for me. And so that, is, well, actually, let's start with the crush, but I'm in classrooms a lot, lots of different classrooms. And I would say one of my biggest crushes just within the last week or two was to walk into a second grade class and have the teacher say, you have two minutes to test each other on your times and and then whoever gets the most is the winner. So they were doing this competition with timed multiplication tables and it crushed me because <laughs> it's, we shouldn't be doing that to students. That's where we're just developing math anxiety. Anyway, so that was crushing to me. But then at the same time, I went into a classroom and the students were just so excited. And one student said to me, uh, I was asking him what he was doing. He's like, whoa, I'm, I'm, trying to help my friend over here understand why we're doing the math this way. She goes, oh, I love math and we get to talk all the time. So I was like, well, that is exciting to see in a classroom. That was a fourth grade class. So in the same school, I saw something that crushed me and, and, and also brought me great joy. So Kareem, thank you so much for taking the time. This was uh, everything I was hoping for in a conversation. I'll make my pitch for reading the book. It's a very easy read. Like I thought I bought it this summer. I'm like, all right, we'll see. But then I think I read it in two days. And it's interspersed with some great math vignettes too that are really helping to exemplify all of this. So it, it's wonderful. And don't forget to visit the website as well. We'll put the link to the Robertson Center panel discussion too, because I thought that was fascinating as well. And uh, Kareem, Steve's going to be uh, on here at some point this season as well. So we'll uh, talk to Steve as well. But we'll put the link to that because... It's now posted on YouTube and it's a, a fascinating conversation, Kareem and Steve and a couple other folks, just about the state of math education. And uh, I love watching, listening to you and Steve interplay. You guys talk really well together. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's become sort of like my math uncle. I really... Isn't he everyone's math uncle? <laughs> <laughs> he's so wonderful. Well, thank you, Kareem. This was great. I, I know we could talk for another couple hours. Thank you so much. I mean, this really, this was a treat for me. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you so much for listening. Another brilliant episode. So, of course, this is the part where we do the traditional podcast thing and ask for favors. And uh, leave a rating. I mean, if you listen to podcasts, you know this already. But if leave a rating because that helps move us up and helps people looking for education podcasts find us more easily. So thank you all very much. And we will see you next time around.